X in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, yeah, thank you for having me. Thanks for coming. So today I'm going to be speaking about this sort of ambitiously titled talk, Anatomy of a Linux. Uh, what I'm really going to be talking about, I guess, is how we produce a mega voltage treatment beam. So just to, I guess, get us all on the same page to start with, let's just take a, a step back and just, uh, I guess, recap what radiotherapy is and what we're trying to achieve. So in, in external beam radiotherapy, we deliver a series of beams to the patient. Uh, and we, our goal is obviously to get a large amount of dose into the tumor and to minimize the dose everywhere else. Um, of course, radiation does damage healthy cells as well as cancerous cells. So it's very important to maximize the dose uh, in, the, in the cancerous cells. Um, and I guess I just wanted to put this up. So as I said, we're all on the same page. Um, and, if, and obviously to do this, we need to be able to produce a suitable treatment beam. And that's really the topic of my talk today. So I'm gonna split this talk up into three different sections. Uh, at the end of it, the goal is to explain the production of a mega voltage X-ray treatment beam. Uh, I know at the moment, these are just pretty pictures that mean absolutely nothing to you, but the goal of this talk is that by the end of it, you understand what's actually happening in each of these pictures. And we'll come back to these as we go as well. Um, also wanted to just, I guess, upfront point out that there are a lot of things that I'm not talking about here, because as I said, the, the, the title Anatomy of a Linac is pretty ambitious, but I'm not gonna talk about treating with different particles, which we do do. Um, I'm not gonna talk about how to generate uh, treatment beams with different energies or bending magnets or a whole lot of other stuff. Um, and I just wanted to point that out, that this is really, I guess, a pretty focused talk onto, on one particular device for producing a treatment beam. Um, I've been told that a good way to engage with your audience is to put some trivia questions throughout the research. So uh, here is the first trivia question for you all. Uh, which well-known US company was intimately involved with the development of one of the first ever high energy electron accelerators? And I know some of you are very competitive, so I've put in a point system. So you get 10 points for any answer. 20 points for a funny answer. Uh, if you get the answer right, basically you're a massive nerd, no one likes you. Is it IBM? No. <laughs> All right. So to explain a few of these things for you, I'm going to need everyone to understand a few basic uh, physical principles. We don't have time for everyone to do a physics degree, so I'm going to be using this technique I learned from the movies called a montage. So over the next five slides, we're gonna be uh, learning all the, the physics that we need to, to know to understand the rest of this talk. So physics is a great science for people with short memories because there's only four fundamental forces that you need to understand. Uh, and these are the gravitational force, which we're all very familiar with, probably some of us more familiar than others. Uh, the electromagnetic force, the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force. And the thing that we need to understand in this talk is the electromagnetic force, which uh, as its name implies, can call it, sort of be split up into two forces, uh, electric force and magnetic force. So I'm going to try and explain this in terms of a force that you understand how it works very well, which is, as I mentioned, gravity. So in with the gravitational force, uh, two masses uh, will be attracted to each other or exhibit, like, exhibit a force on each other. And this is directly analogous to the electrical force, except instead of mass, the thing that yeah, a force is uh, acting upon is charge. So with the gravitational force, two masses, whoops, two masses will exhibit force in each other. With the electric force, two charges will emit, will, uh, I'm not sure what word I'm trying to use, act. Two charges will act upon each other with force. Um, other than that, it, it does behave pretty similarly in terms of like this force will travel in straight lines. Uh, the only difference is with the electric force, it can be repulsive or attractive, whereas uh, gravity is always attractive. The other aspect of the electromagnetic force is a magnetic force. Uh, and this can also be explained using simple terms uh, as being kind of like a ramp. And the reason that I say that is that uh, a ramp will, well, let's just pretend that this skateboarder is in space. So there's no gravity involved and they're just traveling towards this ramp. The ramp will then change their direction, but it's not gonna change their speed. So it can change the energy of the skateboarder. Sorry, it can change the direction the skateboarder is traveling in, but it is incapable of changing the energy. Now, this is exactly analogous to the magnetic force. Um, charge is moving in the same direction as a magnetic field feel no force. Again, this is the same as the ramp. If the, if the ramp is facing in the exact same direction as the existing velocity of the skateboarder, then no force is created. Um, and like the ramp, the magnetic field can change a particle's direction, but not its energy. 
I also just wanted to put in some pictures of what these fields look like. Um, so as I mentioned, an electric field is going to be is, is uh, created by all charged particles. And an electric field looks like this. It travels out in straight lines uh, away from the particles. The magnetic force, on the other hand, is, is created by moving charged particles. Uh, and unlike the electric force, this tends to be curved. So in this case, we have like current traveling through a loop and you can see the resultant magnetic field lines are uh, going through that loop as well. So the take home messages, and I guess what, what, what I would like you to understand for the rest of this talk is that both electric and magnetic fields can produce forces on charged particles. Uh, electric forces can change the direction and the energy of a particle, whereas magnetic forces can only change the direction of the particle. And that is the physics montage over. So you are now to physics, what Rocky Balboa is to boxing. And time for the trivia question answer. I don't know if we, Disney, <laughs> not Disney. So the answer to this question is um, coming up as soon as my screen responds to me touching it. There we go, uh, is Kellogg's. So one of the first ever deep therapy units uh, was installed in this sanatorium run by Seventh-day Adventists. And two of the people managing that sanatorium were the Kellogg brothers. And Will Keith Kellogg went on to found Kellogg's that we know today. And he continued actually to be involved in uh, electron accelerators. And he personally funded one of the original super voltage therapy units. So yeah, uh, actually, if you find it interesting, I was just gonna highly recommend this paper as well. Uh, this goes through all these kind of historical facts. Very good read. So with our physics montage out of the way, we're now ready to start trying to explain what's happening in some of these pictures. And the process of electron accelerator, uh, I guess electron acceleration to produce X-rays can be split into three stages. The first is that we generate some electrons. The second is we accelerate those electrons. And finally, with those electrons, we collide them with a metal target and produce X-rays. So the first thing I wanna talk about is how we generate electrons. Uh, this is called an electron gun, what I'm showing you here. And basically this is comprised of a fermionic cathode Thermionic simply meaning very hot. Uh, a few focusing electrodes that help shape the beam and an anode. So what's meant by cathode and anode here is simply that one of these is gonna produce electrons and one of them is gonna have the electrons be uh, attracted towards it. So the cathode is gonna produce electrons. And basically, so basically what we do with the cathode and anode is they produce an electric field. We have a very hot cathode, which electrons are basically dying to get out of. And the field essentially just pulls them straight out of the cathode. And then with the help of the focusing electrode, we're able to focus this beam down uh, and it enters into the first accelerating cavity, which we'll come to next. We don't have to know what this is right now, but this is basically what an electron beam is. Excuse me. Um, another picture, this is just another picture again of an electron gun, but I wanted to put this one up because I actually have the electron gun here. So normally when I give this talk, um, we can pass the photos that we can pass these physical devices around, you can actually have a look at them. Unfortunately, that won't be possible today. But this, just so you get, I guess, a sense of the scale, this is the actual electron gun here. I, uh, I Brenda, can't, yeah. Your, your camera is a little bit like um, foggy. Yeah, it is. Sorry, I was about to say, I can't see what you guys can see. Yeah, Sorry. it's better. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, so this is the electron gun. Uh, this is just the cathode end of it, which you see here. Um, so this was a piece of research where we wanted to actually be able to build a model of this gun. So we um, took some surface imaging of the of the entire thing, which we were able to use to reconstruct the geometry and then use finite element modeling to actually model the beam from this gun. But yeah, that's basically an electron gun. And I guess one of the key things you should take away from this is that all this is doing is generating a steady stream of electrons. So these essentially, these aren't changing rapidly in time. This is basically a DC electron beam and it's being, uh, as you'll see, injected into the electron accelerator next. So yeah, the next section. So definitely the biggest and most complicated picture uh, of these three and also gonna be the biggest and most complicated section of my talk. So I think a fair question straight up front is, while you've sort of already just demonstrated that if the electrons, if electrons travel for an electric field, they gain energy, as we mentioned, an electric field can cause an electron to gain energy. And we're already sort of producing an electron beam with this electron gun, right? So if you want a stronger electron beam, why not just use more energy in a higher electric field? Like surely the problem solved. And to some extent that's true. Uh, to produce like a, a 1 million electron volt electron beam, all you would need is an electric field of one, of 1 million volts or a voltage of 1 million volts. 
Um, and in fact, that's exactly how the first electron accelerators did work. So these are some of the first ever accelerators to achieve uh, one MeV or one million electron volts. And as you can see, um, these just absolutely massive devices. So that's two people down the bottom here, and this thing's like four or five stories high. Um, today, we produce an electron beam six times stronger than that using a device only this big. So what I want to do is explain how. So the question I always like to pose here is, are you capable of throwing someone two meters into the air? And for most of you, the answer is no, unless you have a small baby, in which case the answer is yes, but I probably shouldn't. But it's a trick question because actually you can throw someone two meters into the air, right? Using something like a swing. So if you think about what's happening here uh, in this system, basically you're pushing, every time you push, you put a little bit of energy into the system. Uh, the system in this case stores that energy. So therefore every time you push, you're adding energy into the system and not losing too much. And over time, the system, uh, like basically the person gets more and more energy and they go higher and higher. Uh, and we can use very similar concepts to this to accelerate electrons without ever having to produce this huge 1 million, uh, volt, 1 million volts of electricity. So the analogous concept is what's called a microwave resonant cavity. And what you can see here is the, the blue here represents a vacuum. So you can imagine this as a vacuum completely surrounded by metal. And if you manage to get an electri electromagnetic field in here of the right frequency, it will resonate back and forth, just like a swing swings back and forth. Um, and so the direct analog to this is the mechanical oscillator, which I guess is a lot more of a familiar example. So in this case, we have a weight uh, uh, swinging back and forth. And you can appreciate that what's happening here is that there's a conversion between potential energy, where it's right at the top of its arc, uh, being converted into kinetic energy when it's at its bottom. And these two are transforming back and forth. That's what is termed a resonant system. Uh, we have a similar thing happening here. We have electrical energy and magnetic energy being transferred back and forth. And basically, uh, these things are just bouncing back and forth inside this uh, vacuum cavity uh, with the metallic walls serving as perfect conductors. Um, now, you can already appreciate that this is a pretty useful looking thing to accelerate an electron because we have this straight electric field. And if I put an electron here at the right time, then it would just get pushed forward. The magnetic field is, uh, you, can, you can ignore the magnetic field for now. It's important to understand the resonance, but for the purpose of acceleration, we can sort of ignore it. So yeah, this is, um, and the advantage of this, just as I mentioned, is like with the swing, that we can put energy in a little bit at a time and build it up slowly and slowly to produce strong fields. Um, of course, you should all be very familiar with a microwave cavity because there's one in your house, which is called a microwave oven. So again, this is a very similar concept where we add energy into this thing and the whole thing fills up with energy. And then if your food's in it, then it absorbs some of that energy and heats up. So that brings me to my next trivia question, which is when is the best time to put metal in the microwave and why? Okay, we'll come back to that later. So as I mentioned, uh, this cavity looks kind of useful for accelerating electrons if you put a hole in either end and just ran some electrons for it. Um, However, there are still limits to just how much you can do with this. Um, there are still limits to how much electric field you can put into one of these things before it causes a catastrophic breakdown and basically uh, you get a lot of sparking and lightning happening. Um, so if we, want to, if we want to be able to boost the energy beyond just this sort of single push, we need to be able to extend the length of the waveguide. Now, when that happens, um, it turns out we get an electric field distribution that doesn't just look like this continuing straight line, but one that oscillates. So we have it going forward here at the same time as it goes backwards here. Um, I think this is actually a piece of physics that I didn't include in my physics montage. So uh, apologies for that. But uh, you'll have to take my word for it that this is what happens. Um, and in principle, it's not a massive problem, right? Because if you can imagine an electron being injected at the start here and being push forward when the arrows go forward. As long as it takes the right amount of time to get here, by the time the arrows are going forward again, it would get pushed forward again, and then again. Um, so in principle, this still works really well. The problem is when you actually try and do this, you figure out how fast the electron would have to go to actually get from here to here in time for the field to reverse. And so, and it turns out that the electron would have to be traveling a fair bit faster than the speed of light, which is definitely illegal. 
electrons can't travel faster than the speed of light and neither can anything else. So we need some way to basically sort of slow this, this whole thing down. And what we, what we call this is a phase velocity simply because it's literally the velocity of uh, this, this wave. So like in most situations, if you want to slow something down, you put something in its way. That's exactly what we do here. So now instead of just a single cavity, we have two cavities. Again, the region where you see the field is a vacuum and everything else around it is metal. So we have two ca cavities now separated by a metallic disc. Uh, what we've done essentially is to put something in the way. Now, if we do this calculation again and see how fast it would, an electron would have to travel to get from point one to point two in the right period of time for the field to still be pointing in the right direction, it turns out that we need now two times 10 to the eight meters per second, which is substantially less than the speed of light. So now we sort of have a much more workable concept for accelerating electrons. Um, I think all I want you to take away from this picture is that we don't have to put the cavity right in the middle of it. We don't have to put this coupling slot right in the middle of the cavities. We can put it in the middle or we can put it at the edge. We get the same effect. Um, and there's some, you know, there's some phys physics going on here, but really all I want you to take away from this is that we do have a fair bit of freedom regarding where we put the location of this coupling slot. And that will become important later. So what's actually going on here? So let's return to our model of, sorry, I'm just moving all the zoom things out of the way. Let's return to our model of the coupled harmonic, or the harmonic oscillator. So previously we had just a single oscillator or a pendulum. And now the analogous thing to coupling cavities together is to couple these pendulums together. And you can imagine doing that using a spring. Now, if you imagine what would actually happen if I had these three pendulums connected by a swing, I mean, I guess what, if you can understand what would happen, then you're already going a long way to understanding what's going to be happening in the physics of coupled microwave cavities as well. So, so the first thing is you can imagine that there are a few different modes of oscillation that could occur. The first thing as is shown in this picture is that you have all of these things swing, swinging backwards and forwards at the same time, right? The second thing is, okay, that's actually kind of complicated. <laughs> I'm going to show you the third thing first. The third thing is that this, the middle one stays still and the inner two just swing in and out like that. And then the final one is that, of course, at any given point in time, every pendulum is going in the opposite direction to the one next to it. So these two are going inwards at the same time as these two are going outwards with respect to each other. Now, as I mentioned, if you understand and if you get a good grip on sort of this, this phenomenon, you've actually, you're going to understand a lot about microwave cavities as well. Um, the first thing to notice is, or to I guess the first intuitive thing to realize is that there's going to be a different frequency of oscillation between all of these systems. Because you can imagine in the first case where they're all swinging in the same direction, there's pretty little force between them all. Whereas in this case where they're always swinging in different directions, the force between them is quite different. And therefore the frequency at which they'll resonate is also quite different. And this can be, <clears throat> this can be explained or plotted on what's called a dispersion curve. So, in this, in the previous example, we had three oscillators and we had three modes of, we had three resonant modes. Uh, and that turns out to be a rule. So if we had four oscillators, we would have had four modes. And if we had seven, we would have had seven modes, et cetera. And what you can do is plot the mode of oscillation versus frequency and you get this thing called a dispersion curve. Um, you can appreciate that the difference in frequency between the different modes is gonna depend on how strongly or weakly coupled those resonators are. So Again, in the pendulum example, that just refers to the stiffness of the spring. Um, in the cavity example, I guess that refers to how big you make the opening between the cavities. Um, and there are some decisions, just design decisions that you have to make that I probably won't go into right now about how you choose that coupling and which mode you want to operate in, uh, in terms of stability and things like that. But I'm going to come back to cavities now. So, I've been showing you so far this pretty simple geometry of a single cavity. But we also, if we look at the actual linac, which I'll show you again, it's small, but it's not light. If we look at the actual linac, the actual cavities don't really look like this really simple. You need to thing. lift it up a little bit. <laughs> Sorry, it's really heavy. Um, yeah. These cavities don't look exactly like this simple uh, pillbox cavity. So what's happening? Why have they changed shape like this? Um, there's nothing super complicated there. The answer is just that like, you want to optimize these fields in a few different ways. There are a whole lot of metrics you can use. If I was giving a more technical talk, we might go into them, but I'm not. 
Um, but basically you want to look at a whole lot of metrics and you want to shape these things to optimize those metrics. And you're looking at things like getting the timing right. So as the particle moves through this cavity, it's going to arrive at the next cavity in, in the right time. Uh, you're looking at things like maximizing the energy gain that the particle receives. And also you want to minimize the chance of electrical breakdown happening because that is quite problematic. So putting it all together, we have our optimally shaped uh, accelerating cavities in the middle. And then we have our coupling cavities on the side. Now, if you recall, I mentioned this mode of, of pendulums where we have the three pendulums, one's in the middle, there's two on the outside moving in and out, and the one in the middle is not moving at all. That's pretty much what's happening here. So these coupling cavities represent our middle pendulum. And then we have our accelerating cavities representing the two other pendulums. And just like with the pendulums, always going inwards to each other, always so always traveling in an opposite direction. If you look at these fields, the field in a cavity, in a given cavity is always pointing in the opposite direction with respect to the cavity next to it. Um, why do we put these cavities on the side instead of on the middle? So like I said, we do have a fair bit of freedom about where to put these coupling cavities. Uh, and one of the major things is that by doing this, it just allows us to shorten the, the length of the accelerator, which is quite advantageous. Um, there are some other advantages as well in terms of stability. Again, I don't think we'll go into too much technical detail for this talk. Um, so looking at these fields, you can imagine already how this could be used for an accelerating an electron, right? So again, imagine an electron starts here, where's my mouse, starts here, travels to the next cavity just in time for that field to reverse, gets pushed forward again, gets pushed forward again, et cetera, et cetera. So let's actually look at that in action. So what we're seeing here is a simulation of the, the process that I just mentioned, which is electrons being inserted into a cavity, injected into a cavity, and being accelerated forwards. So a few things you should notice. I mean, the colors here represent the energy. So you can see that by the end of this uh, process, they've gained a lot of energy. Also, if you just focus for a little bit on a single cavity, you'll notice that some of the electrons are traveling forward, but some of them get pushed backwards as well. There's a little bit of back and forth. So these slides keep advancing by themselves. Um, so what I was going to say is that there is a little bit, there is, a, uh, we're, we're injecting a steady stream of electrons here from the electron gun. Like I mentioned, those aren't really tight changing in time. And just depending on the time that they get injected, they either get pushed forward or pushed backwards. And that process continues in each cavity. So some of them coincidentally make it through at the right time. Some of them miss the bus, so to speak, and get pushed backwards. Um, so we do have a limited capture efficiency with these structures. Uh, in this particular one, it's about 33%. Um, it's not hugely problematic in general. There's no really shortage of electrons in the world. Um, you can also improve this by designing uh, sort of fancy capture mechanics or bunching sections. Um, but again, you're just trading off between how many electrons you capture versus the total length of the accelerator. So for a simple one like this, we just choose to uh, just accept like a pretty average capture efficiency. Right. So what I didn't explain at all so far is how this RF energy or radio frequency, that's how this radio frequency energy actually gets inside the cavity in the first place. I've just showed you a whole lot of pictures of cavities uh, with energy in them. So it's actually, again, nothing too complicated. Like you put a hole in it and pump energy into it. Um, it, it gets complicated if you really want to delve into it. There's um, a whole lot of physics about impedance matching to make sure that you're sort of optimally capturing this energy and not just having it bounce back. Uh, but, it, but again, like the basics is actually pretty simple, right? Like you put a hole in it, you put, you pump energy through the hole. Um, <clears throat> gonna show you this thing again. So you can actually see that, that hole right there this is where the energy would go in and then it would through all the coupling cavities, slowly travel through and fill up the Linux. Uh, that's the other side of it. So this would be the waveguide, uh, which energy would be coming down. Okay. This, this picture is a rotating carbonine gantry. I said I wasn't gonna talk about other particles, but this is the exception. So carbonines are a very advanced form of radiotherapy. Um, they have a lot of very favorable characteristics, but they're very difficult to produce and control. And as a result of that, you see this uh, structure here is about five or six, actually, I don't know how, it's, it's giant. Uh, yeah, and obviously that is problematic in terms of cost, size, uh, and ability to actually treat many people with it. But I just always like to show this picture in the context of 
this previous picture from about, I guess, 60 years ago now, um, because 60 years ago, we were sort of in a similar spot with uh, electron acceleration in that we had to produce these multi-story structures just to produce a fairly, by today's standards, quite low energy electron beam. Um, so I think this is a nice uh, example of technology in action, how technology can really uh, facilitate improved medical outcomes in this case. Um, okay, this slide, it's a little bit dry. I wanted to make a pretty graph, but I ran out of time. But I thought this was all a little bit abstract and I just wanted to talk through the actual time scales on which all of these things are happening. So firstly, the pulse length uh, of the electron beam is about five times 10 to the negative six seconds or five microseconds. And we typically would do on the order of 400 pulses per second, or I guess probably that's more like an upper limit would do about 400 of these pulses per second. So just some simple mathematics, you can see that in for any given second, uh, if we do 400 of these five times 10 to the negative six second long pulses, we've only been sort of on for about 0 0.002 seconds. So the vast majority of the time, we haven't been doing anything. Inside each of these five microsecond pulses, so let's say we're now in injecting a steady, steady stream of electrons for five microseconds into the uh, accelerating structure. Keep forgetting where my hands are. Yeah, you can see me. Okay. So it's really hard to get the zoom thing to do anything that I want to. Um, inside each of these five microseconds pulses, uh, we have an internal Linac frequency, which is what I showed you for those RF fields bouncing back and forwards. So that's about three times, typically, this is about three times 10 to the nine Hertz or three gigahertz. So what that implies, if you think about, I'm actually might show you the picture again. If you think about this, what that implies is that we've got three times 10 to the nine of these little mini bunches or, or bunches arriving uh, every second. So what that corresponds to is that in a given five microsecond pulse, we have about 15,000 bunches of these electrons hitting the target. Um, and then this kind of process would be, I mean, typically the beam on time would be on the order of a few minutes. Um, so yeah, like I said, I just wanted to try and bring this back away from these very abstract pictures into sort of some uh, actual physical numbers. Okay, so the trivia question, when is the best time to put metal in the microwave and why? <laughs> yep, all right, 20 points test, good one. My favorite one is whenever <laughs> you visit Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> wow, sucked in, I don't have a microwave. <laughs> um, well, unfortunately, I had a bit of trouble getting this one through the legal department. So according to them, the correct answer is never do it. It's very dangerous and it will catch on fire. Uh, and of course, the reason it's very dangerous is that metal is conductive. So when you put it in an electric field, such as exists in a microwave cavity, all the electrons in the metal try and sort of run to the surface and get as close to that electric field as they can. And they produce their own electric field. And if that gets strong enough, then basically you get a spark um, or essentially you're simulating the process of lightning occurring, uh, which is why you get, I'm not sure you've ever done it, you get these really cool sparks going on. Um, okay. Fun fact about microwave. Did you know that butter, like the foil around butter is actually metal and not just plastic that's shiny? I didn't uh, until I put it in the microwave. <laughs> yeah, I had, I was going to say I didn't, but I do now. <laughs> I've done the same thing. Um, okay, so now we are two parts through our three part talk. So as I mentioned, there's, this is split into three, three parts. And just to recap, we start with our electron gun. We generate a steady stream of uh, DC electrons, which go in, which are injected into this cavity. Ah, uh, and then through the accelerator, they go for each of these cavities, getting pushed either forward or back, depending on the time. Uh, and then finally, we're up to the final part, which is to collide these electrons with a metal and to produce the X-rays that we actually want for treatment. <clears throat> so what's actually happening here is a process called Bremsstrahlung or breaking radiation. Uh, so literally what's happening is that as at any point when electrons slow down, they're going to give off energy. And when electrons interact with nuclei, they slow down. So we have a whole beam of high energy electrons coming in. We collide them with a heavy metal target and it just has to be heavy metal first because it has big nuclei and secondly, because it's pretty dense. So there's a lot of nuclei close together. And the electrons, as they interact with this metal, they slow down, they lose their energy and they give up or they emit X-ray radiation. Um, and that's really the take home message, I think. I'm not spending a really long time on this section. Um, 
But I just wanted to talk through this picture a little bit more. So what I've simulated here is just a heavy metal target, like a small disc. Uh, the, red, the red lines here represent electrons, and then the green lines represent x-rays. Uh, and so you can imagine that the, the red lines are the electrons coming in from the accelerator. But I think one of the things to really take away from this slide is that these particles just go all over the place. They're, they're, they're sort of directed in the same direction as the electron beam, but they really just go everywhere. So to treat with them, we need some way to shape them and to target them towards a cancer. And that will be one of the things that Jonathan will be talking about next week. So, sorry, I think I've gone a bit faster than I thought, but uh, this is my final trivia, trivia question. Uh, why do electrons emit radiation when slowing down? And the answer is for the purpose of this talk, it's actual magic. Um, because I thought I wouldn't have time to talk about it, <laughs> but I've gone quite fast. But anyway, that is the end of my talk. So lots of time for questions. All right, I do have a burning question. Um, so in, if you have an x-ray tube, you have to do all sort of fancy things to the anode or like the target to make sure that it doesn't melt. Um, is there something similar in Linux? Yeah. Um... So as I mentioned, I didn't talk about at all about cooling, but cooling is very important in all of these processes because they all generate heat. Um, without going into great detail about the difference between an X-ray tube and a Linux, what I will say is that, <coughs> so see these tubes on this thing? They're providing yeah. water cooling. So that's how this is cooled down throughout operation. And I didn't, didn't show you the target, but this is the target. It just sits on the end just sits in the end of the neck. The actual target's that tiny little button right in there. And this has two tubes that are cut away, but this has constant water cooling being pumped through it. Um, and it's definitely a big, I guess, not, I'm not sure if it's a problem, but it's something you have to be very aware of when you're designing a Linux that the target is gonna be adequately cooled because it's, they're operated quite close to the melting temperature. And if you, if you focus the beam a little too much, so it's a little bit too intense, or if you put a bit too much current onto it, you definitely can either damage or even melt the target. So, yeah. Nice. Any other question for Brendan? All right. So there's obviously multiple Linux manufacturer or medical Linux manufacturer. Do they all you like? Do, does what you covered in your talk cover, like basically work for all of them, or is it a specific one? This is a variant six hundred C. Okay. One of the or the major difference I would say between the, the two major vendors in Electra and Variant is that Variant typically use standing waveguides, which is what a standing wave waveguide, which is what I've explained today. Uh, and Electra use traveling wave waveguides, at least on most of their machines. I'm going to go back a bit because there's. I mean, you can understand a lot of a lot of the basic concepts are the same. Where's my picture that I was trying to find? This is so a traveling wave is something more like this, where the wave is literally traveling. Actually, this is a standing wave too, but it looks more like this anyway. The wave is literally traveling along, and it's more rather than thinking of an electron sort of uh, being pushed at each subsequent step, you can think of it more like an electron riding a wave, an actual wave, like a the way a surfer rides a wave. So the electron if you can get it right, the electron just sort of stays in sync with the uh, electromagnetic wave as it travels along the accelerator. Um, but I, it's sort of a, a little bit of a esoteric difference, I guess, for the purpose of this talk. I think it's, yeah, this is, that's sort of the basic physics is kind of similar, I think. Cool. Uh, yeah, thanks, James. So how hot does a thermonic cathode have to get? Uh, very hot. So I think it's operated at about 1200 degrees Kelvin from memory, but yeah, certainly well over a thousand degrees centigrade. Just a uh, aside, 1200 Kelvin is less than a thousand centigrade, isn't it? Oh, I've gone there. Sorry, a thousand. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I've gone the wrong way around. Anyways, yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> what produced the electron at the start? Uh, I mean, basically there's electrons, where are we going here? So the question is what produced the electron at the start? I mean, there's electrons in everything, right? Uh, you just kind of have to be able to pull them out. And then I guess the question is, doesn't this thing run out of electrons? And the answer again is no, because you typically have it at least in some electrical contact with other things. I mean, it just doesn't happen. Electrons travel, electrons fill, fill up that sort of absence of electrons pretty quickly. So the electrons at the start are produced, this is just getting very hot, which means it has a low work function, which is uh, the amount of energy that you need to apply to it to pull an electron out of it. So we have a low work function and we apply a strong electric field, which is strong enough to overcome that work function and their electrons just get pulled off it. And on the other question was the source of RF energy, um, which is something I sort of took out of the talk because I didn't want to get too technical. But uh, there are two primary devices that are used to produce RF energy, uh, a magneton and a klystron. Um, yeah, I guess <laughs> without wanting to get very bogged down, I think you can almost think of these devices as an accelerator in reverse. So they basically use quite a high amount of current and then modulate that current. And then because of these big bunches moving, they produce their own RF. So um, the process is sort of that we have a very, quite a high current that's um, used to produce RF. And then the RF is used to accelerate a lower current. So it's, I sometimes think it as being analogous to a transformer as well, like the process of starting to produce RF with a lot of electrons and then using the RF to accelerate a lot less electrons to a higher energy than the, the ones we started with. Um, yeah, I probably could give a different talk on it if we have to actually go into detail. So you mentioned that um, part of the things you're working on is flash. And one way to increase the amount of dose you can deliver. So for those who don't know, flash is very, very high dose of radiotherapy. So you delivered a lot of radiation in a very short time. Um, so you mentioned here that electrons are delivered by bunch and there's a certain bunch in a certain amount of time and the pulses are five microseconds. Is there any way we could modify a, like this type of LINAC to deliver more bunches in a shorter amount of time to use that for a high dose rate? Or if not, what's the physical limitation? Yeah. So yes, and that's sort of part of the research that I'm working on. I mean, it's actually, I don't directly work on the Linux, it's some other people, um, but it is complicated. So the, the whole process of producing these pulses, these five microsecond long pulses, isn't really like something where you just twitch a knob and adjust like it's, um, it's very high voltage and it's sort of based on charging up capacitors and then discharging. And um, it's, it's not necessarily simple to just change that. Um, the other thing that limits it is the heating of the Linux and the target and things like that. So yeah, I guess probably perhaps the most fundamental limit might be the, the target heating. Um, but yeah, or, or to really change, to really improve the efficiency of these Linux, you kind of have to really re-engineer them from the ground up, uh, which is what the people that I'm working with at uh, Stanford are actually doing. Cool. Yeah, another, another major limitation is how much field you can put into one of these cavities, because if the field gets too strong, as I mentioned, you do get electro, electric breakdown, uh, which is just really bad for the accelerator. Um, and that's another line of their research. They've really looked at redeveloping these cavities in order to substantially boost the amount of field that they can hold without breaking down. Does that work with shape or with material? Mostly shape. Um, yeah. The thing that they, they seem to have discovered is that it was previously thought that the primary cause of breakdown was very strong electric fields. Uh, but they discovered that it's actually the magnetic field that seems to be causing it. And they were therefore able to redesign the cavity with that in mind and um, seem to have been quite successful in boosting the amount of, uh, the amount of field that it can hold. Cool. All right. Um, is there any bur last burning questions for Brendan? I'll give you 10 seconds to think of something. 
All right. Thanks, Brendan, very much for your talk. It was very informative. Um, so I think that's it. Uh, remember to